footsteps behind you as you enter the woods. Night draws back its cape. Light illumines your path. Open your eyes. Listen. Welcome to Dark Softly Tales. Dark stories for dark hearts. I'm Mav Sky. Good evening and welcome to your nightmares with your favorite horror storytelling podcast, Dark Softly Tales. I'm your host, Mav, and I will be guiding you through the bowels of hell this evening with commentary on the bird life they're in. What the heck am I talking about? Tonight's story, of course. Over the next few weeks, I will be reading a story called Pigeons from Hell by Robert E. Howard. The story was originally published back in 1938 in Weird Tales magazine. The story was recommended to me years ago, and when I finally sat down and read it, I couldn't stop thinking about it for days. Even to this day, I find myself wandering there to the old cringy farmhouse with ghostly pigeons roosting on the porch, the sun setting bloody red behind black pines. What a vision. Robert E. Howard is considered one of the original pulp writers. He wrote the Conan series, which some of you are familiar with, especially if you were raised through the 80s. Who could ever forget those movies? (laughs) Anyway, a quick note. I am starting a monthly newsletter for those who wish to keep up to date with the podcast. I'm giving away a freebie audio story called Harvester of Days when you sign up. It's a freaky boogeyman tale told in classic Math Sky style. Check out the show notes for details on how to sign up. Now, lean back, close your eyes, and enjoy this month's story. If enjoy is the right word, a ghost story awaits you. Stay away from the axe and watch out for those pigeons. The birds are not what they seem. Pigeons from Hell by Robert E. Howard Chapter 1 The Whistler in the Dark Griswell awoke suddenly, every nerve tingling with a premonition of imminent peril. He stared about wildly, unable at first to remember where he was or what he was doing there. Moonlight filtered in through the dusty windows, and the great empty room with its lofty ceiling and gaping black fireplace was spectral and unfamiliar. Then, as he emerged from the clinging cobwebs of his recent sleep, he remembered where he was and how he came to be there. He twisted his head and stared at his companion sleeping on the floor next to him. John Branner was but a vaguely bulking shape in the darkness, the moon scarcely grayed. Griswell tried to remember what had awakened him. There was no sound in the house, no sound outside except the mournful hoot of an owl far away in the piney woods. Now he had captured the elusive memory. It was a dream, a nightmare so filled with dim terror that it had frightened him awake. Recollection flooded back, vividly etching the abominable vision. Or was it a dream? Certainly it must have been, but it had blended so curiously with recent actual events that it was difficult to know where reality left off and fantasy began. Dreaming, he had seemed to relive his past few waking hours in accurate detail. The dream had begun abruptly as he and John Branner came in sight of the house where they now lay. They had come rattling and bouncing over the stumpy, uneven old road that led through the pine lands. He and John Branner, wandering far afield from their New England home in search of vacation pleasure, 
They had sighted the old house with its balustraded galleries rising amidst a wilderness of weeds and bushes. Just as the sun was setting behind it, it dominated their fancy, rearing back and stark and gaunt against the low, lurid rampart of sunset, barred by the black pines. They were tired, sick of bumping and pounding all day over woodland roads. The old deserted house stimulated their imagination with its suggestion of antebellum splendor and ultimate decay. They left the automobile beside the ruddy road, and as they went up the winding walk of crumbling bricks, almost lost in the tangle of rank growth, pigeons rose from the balustrades in a fluttering, feathery crowd and swept away with a low thunder of beating wings. The oaken door sagged on broken hinges. Dust lay thick on the floor of the wide, dim hallway, on the broad steps of the stair that mounted up from the hall. They turned into a door opposite the landing and entered a large room, empty, dusty, with cobwebs shining thickly in the corners. Dust lay thick over the ashes in the great fireplace. They discussed gathering wood and building a fire, but decided against it. As the sun sank, darkness came quickly, the thick, black, absolute darkness of the Pinelands. They knew that the rattlesnakes and copperheads haunted southern forests, and they did not care to go groping for firewood in the dark. They ate frugally from tins, then rolled in their blankets, fully clad before the empty fireplace and went instantly to sleep. This, in part, was what Griswell had dreamed. He saw again the gaunt house looming stark against the crimson sunset, saw the flight of the pigeons as he and Branner came up the shattered walk. He saw the dim room in which they presently lay, and he saw the two forms that were himself and his companion lying wrapped in their blankets on the dusty floor. Then, from that point, his dream altered subtly, passed out of the realm of the commonplace and became tinged with fear. He was looking into a vague, shadowy chamber, lit by the gray light of the moon, which streamed in from some obscure source. For there was no window in that room. But in the gray light, he saw three silent shapes that hung suspended in a row, and their stillness and their outlines woke chill horror in his soul. There was no sound, no word, but he sensed a presence of fear and lunacy crouching in a dark corner. Abruptly, he was back in the dusty, high-ceilinged room before the great fireplace. He was lying in his blankets staring tensely through the dim door and across the shadowy hall to where a beam of moonlight fell across the balustraded stair some seven steps up from the landing and there was something on the stair a bent, mishappen, shadowy thing that never fully moved into the beam of light but a dim yellow blur that might have been a face was turned toward him as if something crouched on the stair regarding him and his companion. Fright crept chilly through his veins, and it was then that he awoke, if indeed he had been asleep. He blinked his eyes. The beam of moonlight fell across the stair, just as he had dreamed it did, but no figure lurked there. Yet his flesh still crawled from the fear of the dream, or vision had roused in him. His legs felt as if they had been plunged in ice water. He made an involuntary movement to awaken his companion when a sudden sound paralyzed him. It was the sound of whistling on the floor above. Eerie and sweet it rose, not carrying any tune, but piping, shrill, and melodious. Such a sound in a supposedly deserted house was alarming enough but it was more than the fear of a physical invader that held Griswold frozen. He could not himself have defined the horror that gripped him. But Branner's blankets rustled, 
and Griswell saw that he was sitting upright. His figure bulked dimly in the soft darkness. The head turned toward the stair as if the man were listening intently. More sweetly and more subtly evil rose that weird whistling. John, whispered Griswell from dry lips. He had meant to shout, to tell Branner that there was somebody upstairs, somebody who could mean them real good, that they must leave the house at once. But his voice died dryly in his throat. Branner had risen. His boots clumped on the floor as he moved toward the door. He stalked leisurely into the hall and made for the lower landing, merging with the shadows that clustered black about the stair. Griswell lay incapable of movement, his mind a whirl of bewilderment. Who was that whistling upstairs? Why was Branner going up those stairs? Griswell saw him pass the spot where the moonlight rested, saw his head tilted back as if he were looking at something Griswell could not see, above and beyond the stair. But his face was like that of a sleepwalker. He moved across the bar of moonlight and vanished from Griswell's view, even as the latter tried to shout him to come back. A ghastly whisper was the only result of his effort. The whistling sank to a lower note, died out. Griswell heard the stairs creaking under Branner's measured tread. Now he had reached the hallway above, for Griswell heard the clump of his feet moving along it. Suddenly, the footfalls halted, and the whole night seemed to hold its breath. Then, an awful scream split the stillness, and Griswold started up, echoing the cry. The strange paralysis that held him was broken. He took a step toward the door, then checked himself. The footfalls were resumed. Branner was coming back. He was not running. The tread was even more deliberate and measured than before. Now the stairs began to creak again. A groping hand, moving along the balustrade, came into the bar of moonlight. Then another, and a ghastly thrill went through Griswell as he saw that the other hand gripped a hatchet. A hatchet which stripped blackly. Was that Branner who was coming down that stair? Yes. The figure had moved into the bar of moonlight now, and Griswell recognized it. Then he saw Branner's face, and a shriek burst from Griswell's lips. Branner's face was bloodless, corpse-like. Gouts of blood dripped darkly down it. His eyes were glassy and set, and blood oozed from the great crash which cleft the crown of his head. Griswell never remembered exactly how he got out of that accursed house. Afterward... He retained a mad, confused impression of smashing his way through a dusty, cobwebbed window, a stumbling blindly across the weed-choked lawn, gibbering his frantic horror. He saw the black wall of the pines and the moon flooding in a blood-red mist in which there was neither sanity nor reason. Some shred of sanity returned to him as he saw the automobile beside the road. In a world gone suddenly mad, that was an object reflecting prosaic reality. But even as he reached for the door, a dry, chilling whirr sounded in his ear, and he recoiled from the swaying, undulating shape that arched up from its scaly coils on the driver's seat and hissed sibilantly at him, darting a forked tongue in the moonlight. With a sob of horror, he turned and fled down the road. As a man runs in a nightmare, he ran without purpose or reason. His numbed brain was incapable of conscious thought. He merely obeyed the blind, primitive urge to run, 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 until he fell exhausted. The black walls of the pines flowed endlessly past him, so he was seized with the illusion that he was getting nowhere. But presently, a sound penetrated the fog of his terror. The steady, inexorable patter of feet behind him. Turning his head, he saw something loping after him. Wolf or dog, he could not tell which, but its eyes glowed like balls of green fire. With a gasp, 
He increased his speed, reeled around a bend in the road, and heard a horse snort. Saw it rear and heard its rider curse. Saw the gleam of blue steel in the man's lifted hand. He staggered and fell, catching at the rider's stirrup. For God's sake, help me, he panted. The thing, it killed Branner. It's coming after me. Look! Twin balls of fire gleamed in the fringe of bushes at the turn of the road. The rider swore again, and on the heels of his profanity came the smashing report of his six-shooter. Again, and yet again. The fire sparks vanished, and the rider, jerking his stirrup free from Griswell's grasp, spurred his horse at the bend. Griswell staggered up, shaking in every limb. The rider was out of sight only a moment. Then he came galloping back. Took to the bush, timber wolf, I reckon, though I never heard of one chasing a man before. Do you know what it was? Griswell could only shake his head weakly. The rider, etched in the moonlight, looked down at him, smoking pistol still lifted in his right hand. He was a compactly built man of medium height, and his broad-brimmed planter's hat and his boots marked him as a native of the country as definitely as Griswell's garb stamped him as a stranger. What's all this about, anyway? I don't know, Griswell answered helplessly. My name's Griswell. John Branner, my friend who was traveling with me, we stopped at a deserted house back down the road to spend the night. Something. At the memory, he was choked by a rush of horror. My God, he screamed. I must be mad. Something came and looked over the balustrade of the stairs. Something with a yellow face. I thought I dreamed it, but it must have been real. Then somebody began whistling upstairs, and Branner rose and went up the stairs walking like a man in his sleep, or hypnotized. I heard him scream, or someone screamed, and then he came down the stair again with a bloody hatchet in his hand. And my God, sir, he was dead. His head had been split open. I saw his brains and clotted blood oozing down his face. And his face was that of a dead man. But he came down the stairs. As God is my witness, John Branner was murdered in that dark upper hallway. And then his body came stalking down the stairs with a hatchet in its hand to kill me. The rider made no reply. He sat his horse like a statue, outlined against the stars, and Griswell could not read his expression, his face shadowed by his hat brim. You think I'm mad, he said hopelessly. Perhaps I am. I don't know what to think, answered the rider. If it was any house but the old Blassenville Manor, well, we'll see. My name's Buckner. I'm sheriff of this county. Took a prisoner over to the county seat in the next county and was riding back late. He swung off his horse and stood beside Griswell, shorter than the lanky New Englander, but much harder knit. There was a natural manner of decision and certainty about him, and it was easy to believe that he would be a dangerous man in any sort of fight. Are you afraid to go back to the house? he asked. And Griswell shuddered, but shook his head, the dogged tenacity of Puritan ancestors asserting itself. The thought of facing that horror again turns me sick, but poor Branner, he choked again. We must find his body. My God, he cried, unmanned by the abysmal horror of the thing. What will we find? If a dead man walks, what? We'll see. The sheriff caught the reins in the crook of his elbow and began filling the chambers of his big blue pistol as they walked. As they made the turn, Griswold's blood was ice at the thought of what they might see, lumbering up the road with a bloody, grinning death mask. But they saw only the house looming spectrically among the pines down the road. A strong shudder shook Griswold. God, how evil that house looks! against those black pines. It looks sinister from the very first. When we went up the broken walk and saw those pigeons fly up from the porch. Pigeons? Buckner cast him a quick glance. You saw the pigeons? Why, yes, scores of them perching on the porch railing. 
They strode on for a moment in silence before Buckner said abruptly, I've lived in this country all my life. I've passed the old Blassenville place a thousand times, I reckon, all hours of the day and night. But I never saw a pigeon anywhere around it, or anywhere else in these woods. There were scores of them, repeated Griswold, bewildered. I've seen men who swore they'd seen a flock of pigeons perched along the balusters just at sundown, said Buckner, slowly. Negroes, all of them except one man, a tramp, who was building a fire in the yard, aiming to camp there that night. It passed along there about dark, and he told me about the pigeons. I came back by there the next morning. The ashes of his fire were there, and his tin cup, and the skillet where he fried pork, and his blankets looked like they'd been slept in. Nobody ever saw him again. That was twelve years ago. The blacks say they can see the pigeons, but no black would pass along this road between sundown and sunup. They say the pigeons are the souls of the Blassenvilles, let out of hell at sunset. The Negroes say the red glare in the west is the light from hell, because then the gates of hell are open, and the Blassenvilles fly out. Who were the Blassenvilles? asked Griswell, shivering. They owned all this land here. French-English family came here from the West Indies before the Louisiana Purchase. The Civil War ruined them, like it did so many. Some were killed in the war. Most of the others died out. Nobody's lived in the manor since 1890, when Miss Elizabeth Blassenville, the last of the line, fled from the old house one night, like it was a plague spot, and never came back to it. This your auto? They halted beside the car, and Griswold stared morbidly at the grim house. Its dusty panes were empty and blank, but they did not seem blind to him. It seemed to him that ghastly eyes were fixed hungrily on him through those darkened panes. Buckner repeated his question. Yes, be careful. There's a snake on the seat, or there was. Not there now, grunted Buckner, tying his horse and pulling an electric torch out of the saddlebag. Well, let's have a look. Who likes dark stories? People have experienced a touch of the dark side, and people who are a little wiser to the world. People who like their bones chilled and their spines tingled. People like you and me. It's hard to find a story these days that right on the dark side with a touch of whimsy, humor, and heart. Mav Sky spreads her dark wings and solves this problem for you. Head on over to Amazon and type Mav Sky's name into the search engine, M-A-V-S-K-Y-E. At Amazon, you'll find her Tales to Chill Your Bone series, Girl Clown Hatchet series, and Supergirl series. Snatch up Mav's cult classic novel, Wanted Single Rose, or her brand new release, Cold Hangs the Midnight. Choose your dark flavor and head on over to Amazon today. Or visit her website at www.darksoftlytales.com. You can also friend Mav at Twitter with the handle at DarkSoftlyTales. Be sure to tweet hello. Hello.